Welcome to Bedhampton Church. Contact us at www.bedhampton.church. But for now, let's continue that journey with this input. This is not a democracy. It's a benevolent dictatorship. Those were words that were often heard in our house when our children were growing up, weren't they, Susie? Words I uttered many times, I'm sure. My motives might have been pure, but my method of it's my road or take the high road took something to be desired. Actually, this time of year reminded me because a typical example would be when we were going on holiday. Leading up to the holiday, I would have created a list of tasks and rotors for us all to do so that we could have a fantastic time away together, a fun time together. And then on the day that we were leaving, she's smiling because she knows it's true. <laughs> on the day that we were leaving, I would be the one at the door tapping my watch, asking why everyone wasn't ready and we weren't away on this fun holiday yet. Of course, uh, the outcome of my dictatorial approach was actually the opposite of my desired goal. It meant that everyone started off this fun holiday feeling upset and grumpy, including me. And that's where we find ourselves in our scriptures today. In a similar way, we come to a warning to those who follow Jesus, apprentices to Jesus, of how we, our actions can impact our goal of sharing God's love and friendship. In our gospel, we see an interaction between a priest, a church leader, if you will, a synagogue leader, and Jesus. Jesus heals a woman of an 18-year-long crippling illness. The church leader is so focused on the law and God's kingdom coming that rather than celebrate, he's irate with this person, Jesus, because he's broken the rules of their faith. In fact, he's so irate about that, he misses the fact that he has seen God's kingdom come in his very presence. And then we come to our Hebrews reading, read so well by Anne, a book written to Jewish converts who were in danger of slipping back to their old ways, of seeing salvation as something that could be earned by their actions and what they did for the church and for God. They needed reminding that their glorious salvation was based upon what Jesus did for them. Now, most scholars will tell you that the uh, book of Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul, or certainly by someone who was trained by Paul. And you can see that wisdom of an ex-Pharisee coming out in the Hebrew text. Just before we get to the bit that we heard today, Paul has been setting out what it means to be an apprentice to Jesus. That we need to be holy, set apart that we act in a holy way, that our motives are pure, and people can see the difference in us to others who do not follow Jesus. From an earlier verse, in verse 14, we read, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And he carries on what it means to be holy, to be set apart for Jesus, and how when others see that, they will come to know God's love and friendship. And then he sort of stops abruptly, as though suddenly he's had a revelation from Holy Spirit. And he suddenly realises, hold on a moment, they're going to go back to their old ways of knowing what holiness means to them, the worldly ways. They're going to assume that going to synagogue, going to church makes them holy. They're going to assume that doing things for synagogue, for church, for God, makes them holy. And so he stops and he speaks of two mountains in a metaphor. The first mountain is unnamed but these Jewish converts could not help but know that the mountain he is speaking of is Mount Sinai, the home of the law, the way to be holy. The echoes are deliberately clear in Hebrews and take us right back to Exodus. We read in Exodus, on the morning of the third day there was a thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast and everyone 
in the camp trembled. The way of holiness was received on this mountain for the Jewish faith, the threefold law, three types of law. Firstly, there were civil laws to head up this theocracy, national laws to keep uh, organised, laws like Leviticus 19, which say, do not use dishonest standards when measuring length or weight or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ether and an honest hin. Laws to keep order. And we don't generally believe that these laws are for us today as Christians. They were for the Jewish nation of the time. But a good Jew would have kept the civil law. Then there were the ceremonial laws, the laws used to worship God. And again we read in Leviticus. When anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from your herd, you are to make it without defect. And again we believe that actually our ultimate sacrifice has been Jesus on the cross. So perhaps not laws for us today, but however a good Jew would have kept the ceremonial laws. And lastly, there are the moral laws. Mostly the Ten Commandments, uh, but also elsewhere. And we read again in Leviticus, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. Recognise that one? And these are the laws that we do keep today as followers of Jesus Summed up, of course, by that ultimate summary of Jesus, to love God and to love people. But of course, a good Jew would have also kept the moral laws to remain holy. Or at least a good Jew would have tried to keep the civil and the ceremonial and the moral laws. And that is Paul's point in Hebrews. It's impossible to climb the mountain of Mount Sinai to keep the old covenant, to keep the old laws. And again, we see in our gospel, even the church leaders, the synagogue leaders of the time, missed the point. He was so uptight about keeping the civil law and the ceremonial law that he missed the moral law. Which is why Paul describes two mountains. And he goes on to describe a second mountain. Mount Zion, the new covenant, the new promise. Mount Sinai is a place of fear and trembling. Mount Sion is a place of awe and gratitude. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word, the blood of Abel, then the blood of Abel. You see, we keep the moral law. We act as apprentices of Jesus, not through fear and trembling, but through awe and gratitude. Our God is not a God of lightning bolts. He's not a God of looking down his nose at us. He's not a benevolent dictator. It's my way or the highway. No, our God is a God who reaches out to us through Jesus the scriptures said on Mount Zion, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You are adopted, he's saying, as the firstborn. The firstborn, the one who inherits. You inherit the grace of God paid for by Jesus. You've come to be in awe of God and to know him as Father. My friends, with that truth ringing in our ears, there are two things I'd love for you to consider this week, just to take one of these away with you. Do you believe what I've just said? You have come to be in awe of God and know him as Father. Do you understand the truth that God loves you before you lift a finger for this wonderful parish, before you lift a finger for this church? He loves you anyway. I'd say if you're still not sure of that, 
just hold that in your hand this week. Do I understand that God loves me starting with, to begin with, anyway, before I do anything? But if you think you may have grasped that, help me with our second question. What, as individuals and as a church, do we need to do? Are our actions Mount Sinai? Or are our actions Mount Zion? Are we benevolent dictators? Welcome, come on in, as long as you do things our way. Or do we model Jesus and love them first? Are we so focused on providing the very best for God, for the church, for proving that we are good and zealous, that our actions get in the way of loving people? Consider that with me this week. So two options, my friends. Do you really believe that Father God loves you with grace and with compassion? And if you do, where can we love others in that very same way? Amen. You have been listening to Bedhampton Church. Our prayer is that this helps you journey with Jesus and serve your community by sharing God's love and friendship. Subscribe and join us for more discussion at www.bedhampton.church. All material creative commons copyright. Contact us for more details.